just on behalf of the CDR, uh, Mark and I are both from Calgary, Alberta, where we left yesterday. It was minus 25, so we found it funny when we saw the jackets here at the airport, but uh, very glad to be here. Um, but we do want to acknowledge where we're from in Calgary, uh, that in the spirit and respect and honor, we acknowledge the territories and people of Treaty 7 uh, region in southern Alberta. So that includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, uh, the Sutina First Nation, and the Stony Dakota. And it's also home to the Métis re uh, Nation of Alberta Region 3. Uh, and I know this morning a gentleman acknowledged uh, the, the communities that also called uh, New Orleans home, and I believe it was over 420 communities too, so I want to acknowledge that as well. Great. So I'm going to turn it over to Mark, and he's going to walk through some initial slides, and I'll give you the little clicker. If you, you can either come up to the podium or you can do it from there. I don't care either place. Uh, might, be might be easier here. All right. Thank you. Uh, which? Perfect. Um, so. I'll just give it a little bit of background on, on the Canadian Energy Regulator. And uh, in Canada, we regulate the um, interprovincial and international power line um, and uh, uh, interprovincial uh, pipeline, energy pipeline, so oil and gas. Um, like, like mentioned, the CR is the successor of the National Energy Board, which uh, was founded in 1959. Oops, it's moving on its own now. Hopefully this is not a timing thing. Okay, stop here. Yes, it is on a, some sort of timing. Oh. Okay. Hopefully we'll stay here for a bit. Um, so yeah, it was uh, founded in 1959 and, and it, it changed over uh, in 2019. Uh, and the new uh, mandate includes a commitment to reconciliation with Indigenous people. Overall, uh, 70, 73,000 uh, kilometers of pipeline, 1,400 kilometers of power line. We have a, a, a staff of about 500 and four uh, offices, uh, mainly in Calgary, and then we got one in uh, Montreal, Vancouver, and Yellowknife. Uh, we regulate about 100 companies, and some of the major ones are uh, Nova Gas Transmission, or, and, or TC Energy, uh, Trans Mountain Pipeline, and Enbridge Pipelines. Uh, we are a life cycle regulator, so from the application all the way to abandonment, in, 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 including construction and operation. Uh, we have environmental protection. Uh, in terms of disciplines, we have env environmental protection, safety management, emergency management, security, damage prevention, integrity management, and also socio socioeconomics. All right. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about indigenous monitoring, and um, I want to talk about three different categories that we see uh, in, in that sense from our perspective. Uh, the companies uh, that we regulate usually have an uh, um, indigenous monitoring program, uh, and they've been existing for a while, and um, it's, they use their, their own... Um, their, oh, is it still moving forward? Yes. Can we go back? I'm not sure if... Moving on its own. Okay. <laughs> nope. Pause. Perfect. Nope. <laughs> this is really fun. We can plug, I think we can plug the computer. Maybe not. I thought they were going to run the computer up here. Okay. I think it might be on a... And I'm not sure who set that up, so... Um, just go back to the slides uh, that has one more, I think. This one. Oh. Yes, this one. All right. Um, so yeah, the company has program, indigenous monitoring programs. Um, and then uh, the IMCs, which I'll, I'll describe a little bit later, it's the Indigenous Advisory Monitoring Committees. There's two of them right now. Uh, and we have set up uh, monitoring programs, indigenous monitoring programs through those. And we also have another third type of uh, monitoring programs where we uh, hire uh, indigenous monitors directly through uh, contracts for another a, a third type of uh, a third project that that uh, is included. So uh, I'll provide a little bit more clarity on all of this a little bit later. But 
In terms of uh, monitoring programs by the numbers, in terms of field inspections uh, with the CER, we have over 200 uh, compliance verification activities done since 2017, and uh, the majority of them are on the Trans Mountain Pipeline, um, and uh, about 140 on, on, that, on that system. Uh, Nova Gas Transmission, uh, we have 30, and Enbridge, we have 41. We also had some on the Keystone pipeline uh, before it got canceled. So, like I mentioned the IMCs, uh, if you can go to the next slide. I mentioned the IMCs, and, uh, which, which stands for Indigenous Advisory Monitoring Committees. Um, and they were uh, both, uh, there's two, two of them, one for the Line 3 projects, for Enbridge Line 3, and one for the Trans Mountain projects. And uh, they were both implemented in 2017. And uh, the, com the committees were developed through, co-developed through a series of meetings uh, uh, which, with designated groups uh, to establish shared goals in terms of reference, and um, which was to provide value uh, in the oversight of each pipeline. Uh, they have been, there's been many line-wide gatherings, uh, workshops, teleconferences, and like monthly meetings with, with the, various, uh, the various committees and subcommittees. Um, just a quick note that the committee participation is, is uh, without prejudice, so whether or not you're for or against the pipeline, you could still participate in that committee and provide your voice uh, to, to that committee. Um, each committees are, are made up of a uh, member representative who are um, represented by potentially impacted, from all the potentially impacted nations. Uh, in their respective provinces, and um, along with members of the federal government uh, from the Canada Energy Regulator, uh, National Resource Canada, Department, Department of Fisheries and Ocean, uh, Environmental Canada, Environment Canada and Climate Change, and um, Parks, Parks Canada. And the Line 3 IMC has 15 members from Indigenous, indigenous Nation, and the TMX IMC has 13 members from uh, from indigenous nations. Um, so it all started, uh, the IMCs all started from a letter that was sent uh, back in 2016 before, uh, or just I think just as soon as the project were announced to be approved, uh, from a letter from uh, Chief Ernie Cray, uh, Aaron, I'm gonna mispronounce his name, from Lower, Lower Chief Aaron from Lower Nicola, Nicola sorry, um, to our prime minister asking for uh, a seat at the table and, and be able to um, participate in that. And that's what started uh, the, the whole uh, IMC um, process. And it was, it was announced a little bit later that this was going to be supported. So if we can go to the next slide. The boots on the ground, which is the 140 activities that I mentioned before, are really a big part of, of what the committee uh, and, and the achievements that, that, that uh, we can talk about here today. And it really um, is the fun fundamental part of the relationship with the community and the company and the regulators at the same time. Um, if we can move to the next slide. So the monitoring program, um, there was a pilot started in, in 2017, so just a small uh, group of people trying to see how would that work uh, in real life. And at that time, we had a very high level terms of reference for the, the committee overall, but not necessarily for the monitoring program. And um, so we started working together, uh, understanding what were the needs of, of each parties. And uh, we, uh, and then there was a subcommittee, a uh, smaller group of people from, from the IMC uh, that were um, designated to really talk about um, what the framework would look like and how we could co-develop it so to, to, uh, to make sure that um, everybody would have their say in kind of where we would we'd be going. Um, and the co-development is really important. Like, the government didn't want to go in and, and say, this is how we're going to do it. We really had an open blank page to start with and, and talk about um, kind of how, how to move forward. Uh, and at the end, we uh, normally, not normally, traditionally, indigenous monitors would line up very, uh, very well with 
environmental protection inspection. And we expanded the scope to include uh, also safety inspections and also emergency management exercises uh, evaluation, just to make sure that uh, we had a, a better coverage. And really, the, the team of the two inspectors and the two monitors in the field, they really work as a team. So um, you know, there's obviously different responsibilities and different um, uh, you know, regulated powers and whatnot, legislative power. Uh, but they share observations, they share, uh, they discuss enforcement together, and they report together. So it's, the, the, once they're in the field, the, the team is, is, operates as one. Next page, next slide. So the IMC themselves, uh, the, community, the, the, the committees, um, sorry. Just catching up my, my <coughs> thoughts here. Um, they, they're really there to, uh, to bring some of, some of the, the concerns to the CR's attention uh, in a, you know, I would say in a live fashion. Um, we have been participating, our CEO has been participating in uh, line-wide gatherings where we listen and, and, and take notes of concerns that are from the communities themselves. Um, we've introduced some of the things that we've changed is introduces uh, introduce some letter reports. So instead of just uh, uh, normally we would approve compliance, uh, condition compliance, and things like that, and and just file it on our on our website, uh, we've introduced a new a letter report that highlights all of the decisions we're taking and sending that directly to the committee and, and their communities. Uh, Inspection reports, another thing that we've changed is the inspection report have a section now for indigenous monitoring and, uh, and, and the indigenous monitor can put their own observation directly into it. Um, we've also had discussion forum where we get uh, the company, uh, the IAMC, uh, and the community if, if, it, if, it, if it's uh, to one community specifically, and the CER together in a room to discuss if there's an issue that, you know, it's. It's not necessarily compliance related. It, it's something else that there's an issue there. So we, we get all, all three parties together and, and discuss it and find solution forward. Um, and then we, uh, we've been, uh, you know, obviously at the onset we had to train the monitors, the indigenous monitors and the CR inspectors to work together and, and understand each other's role and, and, and responsibilities. Next slide. Um, Obviously, not all of this was, uh, was always rosy, I have to admit. Uh, sometimes the immediate feedback on our operations was a little bit, uh, was a little bit challenging to, to implement, implement changes and whatnot. Um, but it, it was good because it held us accountable to the commitments we made and also um, alerted, us, uh, alerted us on challenges that, that from a community perspective they, they were perceiving. And some of the example were, uh, you know, we've had a uh, discussion forum and, and, and other workshops on uh, spawning deterrence, uh, sites of sign indigenous significance, kind of trying to understand from a community, pr community perspective, what are, they, um, what are the, uh, the issues that they're seeing? And from the company perspective, what, the, what are their limitations sometimes in sharing the information? And, and found some, some interesting uh, solution that that satisfied uh, all, all parties in a sense. Uh, another piece is we uh, had a bridging program, so indigenous monitors were interested. There was an interest in, in bridging indigenous monitors to uh, regulatory officers, so coming into the CER and, and be part of the part of the team. So uh, we made a uh, looked at the program and from the company's perspective and, and the, the regulator's perspective into how can we do that and what are the um, like the requirements in terms of, of experience and whatnot. And uh, we have started with, uh, uh, we have two full-time indigenous monitors that are working for the CR at this time. Um, next page. So I think I covered a lot of this in terms of lesson learned. Um, you know, one of the, the, the key pieces, you know, on my, on my slide is change is hard, and I've, I've mentioned that already. It's not, not easy when you've been doing it for, you know, since 1959, the same way or very similar way and slow, you know, 
moving at the speed of government to actually now change on a weekly basis sometimes and change uh, how people operate in, in terms of, you know, from a, a top-down approach in, in, in terms of people in the field and whatnot. Uh, it hasn't been always been easy, but I think the, the, um, the benefit of them, uh, of that work has been, has been seen afterwards. Um, the last piece um, is the relationship piece on, on I, I can't comment enough on, on the, main, the main benefit of all of this um, was the relationship that, that we've created with some of the indigenous monitors. And also, and that relationship, what it translates into is, is the understanding of what we do and, and what, what are they concerned about, but also um, bringing that information a little bit beyond just the, in, the uh, inspection officer and, and, and even the monitor. Because that monitor will go home after and will speak to, to their community and say, yeah, I was there, I saw it, and this is what this is what uh, has happened and, and you know I understand the process and I you know and, and kind of share the the information and, and add a lot of trust in, in the whole uh, the whole uh, concept in there I think that's it for slide uh, advisory committee that actually talks right to the CER board. Yeah, so there's, um, there is, so we have a board of director that, that oversees the, the direction of, of the CR, I, I would say, and um, the part of the act allows for uh, indigenous advisory committee, um, and they report directly to the board, so they those direction directly to the upper uh, management, which uh, yeah helps helps the direction of the CR uh, on that on that, that lens. It, one uh, one other question before we move on is: Can you describe a little bit of how both these efforts have perhaps changed the way CER does business or does operations? Um, how long do you have to? <laughs> uh, <coughs> it it has changed a lot and and. Um, you know, obviously the IAMCs originally were uh, not necessarily driven by the CR. They were driven by, uh, you know, the, the, the Prime Minister, and it was, you need to do this. Um, since then, we've had, uh, we've had other projects that have come, come through the, our, our process, and we're applying some of those, those good, like the Indigenous Monitoring Program is, is a good story, a good news story. So we're applying those lesson learned and, and those principles to those projects that don't have necessarily the higher, uh, the bigger structure of the advisor, Indigenous Advisory Committees, but um, we, we still apply the same program to those projects. And then uh, Nova Gas Transmission has many of these smaller projects that we're implementing contracted uh, Indigenous monitors. Great, thank you. We're going to talk a, a little bit right now. We can get the next slide. Did we lose them? Mark it as slide. We're going to talk about the, the two big prop projects that the Indigenous Monitoring <coughs> Committees have worked on, and we're going to start with the Line 3 project. No, oh, that's the wrong, that's the wrong show. <laughs> Should have been all on the same slide deck. I'm looking at it up here, and then... Well, get started, I, I want to introduce Richard, who's uh, an elected council member of the Cowessus First Nation. There we go. Um, and he's just going to talk a little bit about how he got involved and what he got to. And can you go to the next slide? And this is the Enbridge Canadian Line 3 replacement, which is what he's been working on, and that kind of shows a map of it. These are major projects, and, and Richard can describe it a little bit, but you know, it's a 
it's a uh, thousand sixty seven kilometers, which means nothing to me because I'm one of those stupid Americans that can't think in metric. But, uh, um, but luckily, somebody <laughs> clued me in. It's over six hundred miles, and you know it's a forty eight year old pipeline that really needed to be upgraded. So take it away, Richard. And I don't want to mess up your last name, so feel free to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Richard Asakin. I'm not patient zero. I just have a little bit of a throat problem, so <laughs> don't, don't be afraid. Um, but yeah, I, I'm Soto and Cree. Um, my grandmother was uh, Métis, and so a bit of a mixture there. I'm from Cowes' First Nations. I do live on the reserve. I have a house in the upper subdivision, which uh, we jokingly call the Hollywood Heights. Uh, there's a lot of council members that live up there. So we we make fun of each other a lot, so that's where our name came from. But um, So Cowes' First Nations is in the Capel Valley in southeastern Saskatchewan. And um, we have Crooked Lake there. Um, and it goes fairly close to, we have actual lands that um, just uh, east of Regina, we have lands that um, the pipe goes right by um, within a few hundred meters, actually. So um, we have a vested interest in, in what goes on with that pipeline. And our, our philosophy is that um, we're a Treaty 4 nation. And so for those of you that um, know about treaties, um, we made the treaty with the Crown of England. So our nation signed treaty and the treaty made Canada. And so we're, we're, we're pre-Canada. And so that's where our kind of power comes from and that's where our thoughts come from. But anything that happens in Treaty 4, we're part of Treaty 4, we should know about. Um, we don't have the capacity. We've barely had capacity to, to respond to lots of things, but um, I've, since I've been involved as a council member, um, I've taken on the role of stewards of the land, which is land, air, and water, and that involves duty to consult and duty to accommodate, which is a, a legislated process protected under Section 35 of our Constitution. And um, we're, we're, I showed up at a meeting um, to, to actually participate in this, this pipeline, the terms of reference for the committee. <coughs> Sorry, it'll go away. But... Um, so Chief Cadmus DeLorme showed up in February 23rd, 2017. And so we know that the Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, set forth that there should be committees attached to these areas, um, Trans Mountain expansion, and then Line 3. And so he went to a meeting in Calgary. He came back and said, they're going to do this committee. You should, you know, tap me on the shoulder, you go. And um, I helped develop their terms of reference and um, negotiated all kinds of things with them. Um, just creating the committee. They wanted a committee member that um, was part of the terms of reference, so I submitted my name. And um, in the end, I get I got selected and appointed. It was a big process where the chiefs had to get together in a room and, and select you and nominate you, and then you get confirmed by government, and then you get appointed to that committee. It's quite the process, I thought. It was very um, good vetting. Well, they got me, so. <laughs> just kidding. I, I'm very humble. <laughs> The line three replacement app these days? Is it, is it a dozen the, yeah, October 22nd is completely decommissioned. <clears throat> um, so when the committee was started, it actually was already under construction in Alberta. And so we had Alberta members that um, couldn't really be involved. And um, we manage poverty every day in every nation. And there's over 600 nations in Canada. And there's there's a lot in Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. And so when they see pipeline and major project, and that's a $7 billion project. And so it's, it's very valid for nations to try to get and direct some of that money towards their nation so they can get contracts. But Bannister, I believe, was the general contractor, and they already had their subcontractors laid out, and they were already under construction. And so we did help create the monitor program to do construction monitoring on the line and to do post-construction monitoring and then even decommissioning monitoring and, and integrity digs and, and all this stuff I'm learning myself. You know, I'm a trained counselor, not, not I'm an elected council member, but I'm actually, I've got a master's of science in counseling. And so it does help me, but um, this is all really new. Um, this file is really huge, uh, stewards of the land. Um, but being part of this pipeline, you learn the language, you learn the major project lingo. You learn what goes in, into everything. Pipeline safety, I'm still on the... I was a, the 
subcommittee chair of emergency management and I did webinars and trying to linkage the dollars to nations and so they can help out uh, build capacity for our response if, if there's ever incidents in the local area. But um, yeah, it was decommissioned on October 22nd, just a month ago, basically. Can you think of, just off the top of your head, one of the recommendations that the monitoring committee made that changed what Enbridge was going to do or changed what CER was planning to do? Yeah, well, one of the things that we're, we really want to do, and I know with TMX Trans Mountain Expansion, they have this decision called Delgamuke, culturally modified trees, culturally modified areas. And what we're trying to do with monitoring is identify culturally modified landscapes. I know Mark doesn't, um, isn't really aware of that, but for, for me and for our nation, you know, Mike Oka, one of our committee members, is he's very wise. Um, He's very protected of cultural heritage, but even teepee rings are evidence that we exist in, in these areas. And so when a pipeline goes through, the rocks just get tossed aside, but that's evidence of our existence. So some of the things we're trying to do is just protect cultural heritage, you know, those chance finds and create a, a protocol to actually deal with chance finds like that as far as First Nations um, burials and, and objects and artifacts are concerned. That's one of our influences. I think you had a hard time getting here. Richard and uh, Chief Shackley both uh, came from Vancouver. Had some <clears throat> exciting times getting in and out of Vancouver, and uh, Chief Shackley actually had to get across the border and fly to Bellingham the day after I left, and uh, um, spent too much time getting across the bridges and stuff in Vancouver. Um, we're going to move on to the uh, the TMX expansion project, and just uh, I'd like to introduce um, both Chief Shackley. Um, next slide, please. His bio is there, you know, he, he was re-elected for his second term as chief um, in November 2016, and I'll let you read the rest of it. He's a member of the uh, uh, advisory monitoring committee for the Line 3 expansion. And Sean Brett, next slide, is the senior director of environmental health and safety for Trans Mountain Expansion Project. And I'm really interested to hear about this because Trans Mountain actually crosses the border, and I drive right across the pipeline there every day, coming and going. So uh, um, they're not expanding in the U.S. It was a Canadian-based thing. And, uh, next slide. There's a, a picture of the Trans Mountain, Trans Mountain Expansion Project, which goes all the way from kind of the tar sands up in Alberta all the way down to Vancouver, more or less. And I'll let uh, uh, Sean has put together some slides, and I'll let him walk through those. <coughs> Sure. I just I th thought I'd give a, a, an introduction to the project. It's um, it's a pretty large project. It's probably the largest uh, infrastructure project in Canada today. Um, we're we're a small mid sized company. We're we're the only company that's actually shipping product to the west coast to overseas markets for Canada. Um, our current capacity is about um, uh, three hundred thousand barrels a day. We're with this project. We're tripling that to about nine hundred thousand. So we're building um, 980 kilometers of new 36 inch pipe, uh, plus we're reactivating 193 of existing pipe. Uh, in addition to the pipe, we're building 19 new tanks, 12 new pump stations, um, and a large marine terminal with three berths to allow Afro max size tankers mm -hmm. to come. Um, it's a 20, $21 billion project. I'm very proud to say that to date we have over four, $4.5 billion of committed contracts to Indigenous communities as well. So it's a big part of, of, our, of our, who, who we are as a company. And if you go through these slides, it just gives you a little bit of flavor of what the project's like. A lot of steep terrain. We start in Edmonton, we cross over the Rocky Mountains, we go through provincial parks, uh, national parks. Lots of steep slopes. We have, um, we, we, we almost call it a major trenchless project because we have over 80 major trenchless crossings, um, hundreds of minor trenchless crossings. Um, next slide. Um, some more pictures of the main line. We also go through a lot of urban areas. So, in addition to some of the areas um, that we go through in the mountainous terrain, we're in the picture, you know, the top left, we're in people's backyards. Um, bottom right, we're, we're right next to, to highways. And if you go to the next slide, um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm also happy to say we're we're 77 percent complete as of this year. Um, so we'll be we'll be wrapping up next year, and we're we're into the to the reclamation phases, and in, in mainly in Alberta, moving moving west. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, 
Um, this is just gives you an example of two of our terminals. Um, the bottom picture is the Edmonton terminal, uh, and the top right is our Burnaby terminal that has the largest expansion. And this next slide is, is one of the most exciting things. I came out of the project in 2017, and um, we started, this is kind of where, where we started, uh, the Westridge Marine Terminal. Uh, you'll see there the picture, there's three new berths, and we actually had to build that entire foreshore um, to be earthquake resistant uh, to bring in those, those new ships. Um, it's been a, it's been, I was talking to Mark on the, on the way here, it's been probably one of the most complex projects. Um, you know, we filed back in 2013, we got our original certificate um, to, to, to construct, and then that certificate was taken away. Um, so there were a few uh, indigenous communities that um, uh, put together a, a lawsuit um, uh, because the Crown's duty con to consult said wasn't sufficient, essentially they won. Um, we had to go back, the government had to, to reconsult um, for the marine portion of the project. Um, they did that, we got our, our new certificate uh, and restarted construction uh, again. Um, it, and it was funny, the day after our certificate um, was taken away, our, our company got sold to the Canadian government uh, and then we went through that process and then we got our certificate back and then we went through a, um, a, a season of fires, uh, us and everyone that, that work, work with us, season of, of extreme fires in Western Canada that a lot of people <coughs> heard. And then last year had one of the largest natural disasters in Canadian history with the flood. So it's been, a, it's been a, a, an interesting um, uh, time. So, so that's kind of the, the project in a nutshell. The pipeline is still owned by the Canadian government? Uh, the, the, the pipeline is still owned by the Canadian government. Um, yep. And, and so as we're, as we're moving through, that will be kind of one of the futures is, you know, everyone's talking about the, the sale of the company in the future. All right. And Chief Shackley works on the Indigenous Advisory and Monitoring Committee for the Trans Mountain Expansion Project. Do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself, Chief Shackley, and uh, how you got involved and what you think about the whole project? <coughs> Yeah, so uh, Chief Marcel Shackley from the Nui Chindin Band, a member of the unceded Inflakapak territory. So I reside in, in, in my community in, in Nui Aitch, as well as in Vancouver in the unceded territory of the Musqueam, Sl Squamish, and tsleil tooth peoples. So usually when, when we have our meetings, we start with a prayer. We, we have an opening, uh, maybe a, a welcoming song. Pre-COVID, what we used to do is, is we, we would move our meeting along the corridor, the right-of-way corridor. So we'd go into the communities and, and sit with them and, and enjoy food with them and, and hear their conversations. And uh, when, when we had it in, in Merritt, uh, we've never seen a project this size. So with that influx of workers, staying in, in worker accommodation sites, I didn't know what, what impact that was going to have on my people, on my women, on my youth, on the drug problems, on the alcohol problems, on violence, homelessness. So we, we did have a, a, uh, a ceremony for them singing we're Indigenous women. So that we weren't just kind of thinking about it. So shifting it from there into the heart where it's like, Feel it with us so, so that we can make the changes that we need to make. So we do, we do do monitoring on, on those, the social impacts. So there's a couple of pilot projects, one, one in the uh, Fraser Valley area, another one in the interior closer to Alberta, and another Alberta uh, monitoring program, monitoring social economic impacts. So to actually zero in and, and look at those things, we're, we're hoping that the, the act of observation is going to change the outcome. So everybody on the committee participated in that. So when I'm working with uh, the other Indigenous communities across, across the quarter, we sit with the federal regulators. So when we have concerns and issues, it's not, I, I don't go to Mark and Mark says, hey, no, go talk to the guys over there. And then they send me to the next room and the next room. We have, we bring everybody into the same room and have the conversation once. So, so the efficiency is a lot greater improved, the communication and the relationship buildings. So inside of the, the actual committee, that, that's been pretty solid. 
So if somebody was a chief and, and then they, they move, they still retain their seat. So a lot of the federal committee members are the same. But I mean, the communities that are represented, we, we have annual, annual meetings with those communities every year. Because out of 129, I can guarantee you that the leadership's gonna change. That the people coming to hear our story are gonna change. So we gotta keep on, keep on with that message and listen to their concerns. And, and so when we give our presentations, we tell them, this is what you told us last year, and this is what we've done this year. So I think that we're heading in, in the direction that, that you're pointing us in. And, and that way, it's a reflection of their concerns and interests being accommodated or any impacts mitigated. The, uh, the salmon in my area, really, really big and important to my people. So the sockeye salmon and, and uh, protecting those for, for future generations. So making sure that, that this project doesn't impact them negatively. So if my community members came in and said, hey, chief, what's happening over here? Or that's what the IAMC C does, is they mobilize the indigenous monitors <coughs> to go out there and check with the Department of Fisheries and Oceans to make sure that uh, what we say is happening is actually happening. That way I can go back to the community member and say, hey, it, it's, it's being looked after, it's being taken care of, We'll check back again in a little, little bit to make sure that everything was wrapped up. Can, can you give us a specific example of where you provided <coughs> input in either CER or uh, Trans Mountain has kind of changed what they were going to do? The, there was a, uh, the use of what they were calling anti-spawning mats inside of the, uh, the right-of-way corridor. So they installed these mats. Uh, procedurally, uh, you're supposed to get a section nine permit and, and that section actually shifted, I forgot what the new number is, but a, a permit to actually make changes in and about a stream. So they were installed in one area and, and once we heard about it, then that became the hot topic. And the whole committee was in an uproar because it wasn't done correctly. So after that, they, they had agreed to, to not utilize those, those mats and, and try other methods, either uh, drilling, I forget what it's called, directional drilling. Yeah. Yeah. So find, finding other, other ways to, to gain access. I'm assuming that uh, these committees are, are kind of expensive to have your meetings and to pay for your monitors. And uh, from what I've read, you know, you help fund projects in, in different communities and stuff too. Can someone talk about the funding that has flowed uh, to both co committees? Anybody put kind of a, a bounds on that? It, it seems like I read that, that maybe Line 3 got $30 million and Trans Mountain got 50 the, the monitoring committees. Yeah, tell us why you got more. <laughs> 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 I'm just kidding. Go ahead. That, and that, that's a, and the reason I bring that up, that sounds like an astounding amount of money for communities in the U.S. that don't get nothing. I'll, I'll take a quick stab at this question. So the, uh, we talked about the first certificate of public convenience and necessity. So in the failure to actually achieve a level of, of consultation and accommodation, so when it was found that they were, they were deficient, go back and consult. So that time delay, the, the valuation of time, so it went from a $7.4 billion project 14.8. So even today, 14.8, that actually sounds like a bargain because now it's over 20 billion. So to really evaluate uh, the value of time. So, so if, if the concerns and interests were met the first time, then maybe we would have still been closer to the 7.4. So the amount of funding that we did receive, 60 million, Versus seven point, an additional seven point four billion. The sixty million to me sounds like a bargain. So, I've seen so many projects that that go through the consultation process and and the negotiators and the positions that they take it burns off time. And that time, in, in terms of being able to implement and execute on time on budget, 
right? So, so with inflation doing what it's doing right now, could you imagine if you were going to start a project last year versus this year, how much more expensive that's going to be? Oh, my my only comments in relation to the uh, the amount of funding. I was going to say something. The, the TMX, the Trans Mountain, got a lot more money to operate as a committee because they had to do studies on marine biology and marine life and and tide water and all that kind of stuff. And in uh, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba, there it's a much larger span, but um, it's prairie land and it's mostly um, private land, and it's probably about two percent that is crown land, which is public land, and so. Um, there's about 100 and 119 nations that are impacted, and, but realistically, there's more like 137. And so we have a lot of, um, you know, all those meetings that we have to go to, we have to do studies, we have to hire consultants. And, and the money that we get, um, it, it's, it doesn't involve a lot of studies for whales or marine life and that kind of thing. Yeah. I, can add, I, I can add one additional thing to, to the, uh, the overall budget. Does, does Canada get to ship its oil to market or not? So to allow $60 billion to, to cap the potential development of its oil resources. So to, to see how much resources are sitting behind it, $60 million is still, I think, a really good deal. So it's interesting you're talking about having to do these biological studies and those things that are expensive and that that's where the money went. Can you talk a little bit about how the committee operates? I mean, are you independent, or does how do who decides who to hire for those types of studies? Is that a committee decision? Yeah, we usually get involved in the hiring of people. Um, the Secretariat, it's Government Natural Resources Canada. Um, we do have committee members that participate in hiring of their staff, and then we have our own contribution agreements from the nation so we do pay consultants that we hire we decide so we hire we fire that kind of thing but um, most of the committee members that do this like for me it's off the side of our desk it's not our full-time job we just kind of do this um, in very limited time extra time throughout the day but it does take over most of the day um, I would say we have a lot of autonomy they give us the money, we decide, we set the budget, and we spend it according to what we need to do for our, our priorities. Where, where does the money come from? Is that from the federal government, or is it from Enbridge and Trans Mountain? Well, interesting, we just finished our line wide at the, the line three, and, and some young lady asked me personally, how come Enbridge is dictating your guys' committee? And so the impression from her first meeting was that Enbridge gives us money to invite people to this meeting, but we get money directly from the Canadian government. It's it's kind of um, flowed through NRCAN, and it's flowed through nations. They get their admin fee, but in the end, we decide whether Enbridge is going to be at our table or not. And so I had to inform her that the misconception that Enbridge is sponsoring all this kind of stuff, no. This is this is, goes deeper than its reconciliation, its inclusion, and for Article 18 of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, we have a right to participate in decisions that affect our rights as Indigenous people. So this is where it's going, and um, yeah, we, we we get the money from the government just like anything else, and um, we decide what to do with it. We have any to add to that? One of the questions I know will come up, and I'll just ask it now instead of waiting for the audience, is that we've heard of a lot of opposition to both Line 3 and, you know, the TMX expansion. Um, how does the committee deal with opposition, and are committee members who are opposed or have concerns included? No, the, the, the way that I, that, that, that I would view it would be uh, the government was saying we will build it at all costs. You have another group that says you'll build it over my dead body. Right. So 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 where do we meet? I believe that the IMC is kind of meeting in the middle, where it's if it's going to be built, build it right. So no cutting the corners, kind of watching each movement, and being comfortable with with each one of those movements. So I believe that the IAMC is meeting in the middle. So we have committee members that have signed off on, on agreements and have contracts on the project. 
on the Trans Mountain expansion. And we have other, other communities that took them to court. And we all sit at the same table. So the elimination of those silos of us versus them, where it's like, no, us versus us. Help us help you help us. Mark, do you think it has helped? It has, you know, I think these things already always get put together because the, there's been trust lost and people are trying to rebuild trust. Has, has this helped? Yeah, I, I think I think it has helped. And, and uh, like you just mentioned, trust is, is the piece that had eroded in the past. And I, you know, I'm not saying we, it, there's, it's there 100% now, but it's definitely much better than it was uh, at the beginning. Yeah, yeah, and just to add to that, I think, um, <clears throat> you know, when, when the IMAC was first created, uh, you talked about the collaboration. It was, when it was collaborated, it was collaborated between the communities and the, and the government. Um, the company wasn't involved. And so when it first came into being, um, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't easy. Mark and I were, were talking about this again. Um, there was really a, a, a lack of identification of, of where the roles and responsibility, what's in scope, what's out of scope. Um, so, so for the company management, it was confusing, but more importantly on the ground, you know, the company has an indigenous monitoring program. We have a lot of procedures and policies. And so it, it really started impacting the folks on the ground at first, when it first came into being, um, the indigenous monitors were put in conflict with the IMAC indigenous monitors because they were asking questions that, you know, nobody knew is this in scope, is this out of scope? It, it was almost as, as if we felt like the, the, the end zone on compliance kept shifting and was blurred. And so what had happened was um, leadership from each group, so from the CER, from the IMAC, uh, and from the company, all committed to making this work. So, so they sat down, they said, you know, we'll, we're going to make this work. And, you know, the, the session this morning, there was that nice process that, that was developed in terms of this is what it's going to look like, and now we're going to stand up this policy. As Mark was saying, it was more like, a, here, okay, make it work now. And then kind of figure, build, build the ship as, you, as you're flying it. Um, so what, what happened is, and Chief Marcel and I were on, the, on this, it's, it was a policy table. Um, so it was uh, senior leadership from each group came together to start basically talking. And there wasn't a lot of trust at the beginning. Um, there was some confusion. And over time, a lot of in-person um, meetings, workshops. I remember meeting, you know, we met in Vancouver or, or, or Calgary. After time, um, we started gaining the trust. And then it wasn't until the policy table developed a shared goal. So it was, it was an objective-based goal that we said, OK, this is what we are all aspiring to. So Trans Mountain, for your program, and for your participation, you're trying to achieve this goal. IMAC, CR, you're trying to achieve this goal. And then that kind of helped us. That was our North Star to, to figure out you know, where we could go. And ever since then, we started gaining traction. And I think um, we're, in a, we're in a pretty good place today where uh, people are getting out on the ground, like the IMAC monitors, uh, indigenous monitors are on the ground. Our indigenous monitors are on the ground. Our indigenous monitors are reporting back to the community. The indigenous monitors from IMAC reporting back to the committee and to the communities. And I think through that, through that kind of overlap of, of participation from, from both programs, we're getting a lot of kind of uh, cycle back and forth of feedback from the community. But it, it wasn't it wasn't easy at first. It was it was pretty challenging for the first year or two. All right. We've got about 15 minutes left, and I have a whole list of questions, but I really want to let people out in the audience uh, ask some stuff, too. Is there anything any of you want to say that, that make sure they understand how this works? Because I'm assuming a lot of people, this is the first they've heard of this whole effort north of the border. Should we open it up and see what? All right. Who's got questions? I do. <laughs> how would I know that? <laughs> yeah. yeah, what a surprise. Um, I'm, th this is great, I, and this is really um, insightful for, for a lot of reasons, and very applicable to the U.S., or what I hope could be ap applicable to the U.S. I'm curious how to hear from both industry people and from, from tribal members, um, First Nations people, how you're incorporating indigenous knowledge into, you're, you're talking about studies that's very scientific, very colonial, and in some some would argue, um, and so I'm curious where the indigenous knowledge piece comes in and incorporating this in some of these decision making around uh, siting pipelines, planning pipelines, and monitoring pipelines. Uh, 
Hi. Yeah. Well, there that that's a big question because there's traditional land use studies that we do. We have that's proprietary to the nation. We don't share those because some of that is cultural, um, and of course some of it is berry picking areas. And in fact, some 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 of the corridors that are reclamated actually become some of the best berry picking places. So it's it's important for us to protect that pipeline so it, there's no incidences or if there's an incident you respond right away because that's where the best berries are sometimes it's strange but um, um what was your question again about <laughs> i was curious how how, how envisioned right yeah i was <clears throat> getting on a tangent there yeah well we got world view written right into our terms of reference and so what are our values? What are our takeaways? And um, inclusion is part of that. So how do we introduce worldview to a compliance-driven industry where they give certificates of convenience and they have to do filings that are in compliance? And how do you, you, know, how do you measure that? That's actually that's the huge job. So how do, we, how do we shape the lens in which the CER looks at a project? And they have to have a consideration that is First Nations, value-driven, to also place on that. And that's where the tough work starts. So we can do a lot of the, the monitoring and protection of things that are tangible and tactile. But realistically, idealistically, how do you incorporate the values of a First Nations people that um, an agency like the NEB, now the CER, has taken decades upon decades to evolve into its own sovereignty protection and you know giving certificates of convenience so that companies can go in and make a lot of money and so when you introduce first nations people the world view is very important because trust is important but respect also is very important and so that's where a lot of the work has to take place and that's a very diplomatic process you got a lot of angry people on both sides you got a, a lot of ignorance on both sides and and really it's just um like our first two years on our committee is just headbutting not only with industry not only with the cer the neb at the time we had peter watson the chairman coming to a lot of our events and it's just being seen and being talked to and listening and you might think that that's all just touchy-feely kind of stuff. But realistically, if we as First Nations people don't see you anywhere, how can we trust that? And so if you don't listen to what our worldview is and validate us, validate it with us, then what's the point? And so we can shape industry as well, but in a good way, if we just got to find those answers. Yeah, and <clears throat> maybe I'll add from an industry perspective. So, so in terms of incorporating uh, indigenous knowledge, there were three kind of main ways we, we did. One is the traditional kind of studies, as, as Richard was talking about, that we use in our in our application um, and whatnot. Um, the the second is through relationships. So so, you know, working with communities as partners was part of the values and vision of our previous president and continues today with our, our current leadership. And so we started these discussions with the communities back before the project filed its, its application and everything. Those develop partnerships that we're gonna continue through operations in terms of maintenance, but it's through those relationships that we also gain knowledge about what's important. So for example, there were two areas that were considered sacred areas of, of these communities. And so even though we had already kind of done our, our routing, we, we changed our route. Or in one case, we actually um, committed to trenchless crossing throughout the entire area. It's now one of the most critical path parts of our project, but it's one of the promises that we made. And, it, and it was so it's through those ongoing relationships and the sharing of information and the building, ship, building of relationships that you know, they come to us and say, this is a really important place. Can we, we, we need to do something about this. And then we sit down and we talk about what we can do. And, you know, just because, just because a pipe, and that's actually happened, I think, two other times on the, on the project where uh, the route's already decided, but we learn after about something that's important. So we change our, our route around it. Um, and then the third is through the Indigenous Monitoring Program. 
Um, so we have indigenous monitors out on the site as integrated uh, <coughs> members of our, our environmental inspection team. So they, they have all the same rights, responsibilities. They're in chart. They're they, they're out there with the inspectors. We have a bridging program. They can become inspectors. But if they come to a situation where they say, "Hey, hold on here," whether it's a culturally modified tree or uh, Chief, some uh, we had an indigenous monitor from Chief Marcel's uh, community, um, and Chief Marcel, you're going to have to. Correct me, I forget the actual traditional name, but it was the water spirit. We were coming to a place where there were some water spirits, and we wanted a, the, the um, monitor said we should do a, a ceremony, and then so then we arranged for a special ceremony to be held before we started construction in that area. But it's not something you could do or know beforehand. Um, and, and these are all great, but it really has to come down to the company and to the people in their leadership positions and the values and the vision, right? So. For us, fortunately, we had um, we had leadership that were really this was part of of who they felt the company should be, um, and so we're part of that value and vision, um, which has made it part of how we do our work. But I, I know not every every company has that leadership that sh same that sh share that same perspective. Time for maybe one more question. Oh, can oh, actually, oh, I'll, I'll add a little bit to that as well. So uh, the other way to do it is is to hire. The monitors train the monitors from the communities so their ability to, to take their monitor and their monitor to go back to their elders to ask some more sensitive questions where they might not give it to me but they'll give it to one of their own people so and inside of the preparation they would have time the the monitor would have time to go out to the community and and ask questions to make sure that they were most mostly informed to be able to work in that that area In uh, Canada, for the programs that you're talking about, setting up the committees and funding them, have they been applied to other communities? Like, I don't know if you use the same terminology, but what we would describe as environmental justice uh, communities, do they do that in Canada? And then uh, associated with that, you said the money comes from the Canadian government. Uh, is it out of the general fund, or is it based on an assessment of oil and gas, or whose money is it that, that comes down? I'm just curious, thinking about ways to replicate it uh, in the U.S. Yeah, in terms of where the, the your last question there, in terms of where the money comes from, it's the general. Uh, it's not necessarily associated to anything. It's just the general funds. Uh, in terms of the uh, um, the other part of your question, uh, and now I just forgot, I just lost it. <laughs> oh, it's. Um, I think it was you know uh, other programs oh, yeah. like. Yeah, there's there is participant funding that that. That is uh, available for all projects, uh, and and if you want to participate in, in any um, uh, aspect of, especially on the application side, uh, there's participant funding that's available uh, for anybody who wants to participate. So not not only indigenous people. In terms of larger committees like that, um, there might be other similar, but not not to that not to that scale for sure. Any of the provinces started to kind of replicate this on the pipelines they oversee? Because it's a little different in Canada about who, well, the provinces oversee a lot of pipelines. Yeah, uh, maybe Chief Marcel, you might be able to speak to, I think there's a few programs in BC. Uh, provincially, uh, the, the overarching principles of the United Nations declarations on the rights in, of indigenous people. So the federal government adopted that, but also British Columbia is one of the only provinces that's actively working on this. So my community is, is kind of at the ground zero of, of the uh, 2022, 2021, 2021 uh, atmospheric river. So we've seen water flows that, it's a one in 750 year event, which destroyed infrastructure surrounding us. So after working on this committee, and trying to work with the province, I said, this this is how we should do it. We should get all the players in, in the same room at the same time and have conversations about this. So trying to mimic what we're doing on this committee, but on a provincial scale, uh, re related to infrastructure, not, not pipeline, or the British Columbia Oil and Gas Commission type work. Yeah, and, and I know um, the BC Environmental Assessment Office, I believe, has a, has a similar program. Um, for indigenous monitoring, um, and I know the BC Archaeology Branch, which is part of the Ministry of Natural Resources for, in, for Flinro, 
they also, I believe, have some similar type of programs that they're starting to to, to start up as well. We need to wrap it up. Yeah. Also, I just want to quickly say, too, that uh, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba have very conservative governments, and um, British Columbia has a new Democratic Party, and so there's the difference there in, in approaches and and inclusiveness. But um, for Saskatchewan, you got to give them kudos. So in other areas, they, they are starting to hire Indigenous advisors as individuals, attaching them to their internal agencies to help them navigate um, Native issues wherever they confront them. So it's a good effort in Canada to reconcile and in, be inclusive and also let First Nations be part of those decisions that are going to affect the future. So, yeah. Great. Help me thank these folks for coming so far. And I wish we had more time because I can see there's some pent-up questions, but... Uh...